Welcome to episode 32 of 100 Years of Marine Corps Tankers, a station dedicated to honoring the legacy of Marine tankers and remembering the stories of what made the community special told through the words of those Marines that towed the line. Today, we are joined by a Marine that honorably served for 20 years during some of the most tough and most transitional periods of our Corps. It is through the service of these great leaders that the path for today's Marines were paved. Welcome to the channel, Master Sergeant Bruce Van Appledorn. Thank you, JR, for having me. Absolutely, sir. It's my pleasure having you on here. Let's start at the beginning. How did it come to be that you enlisted in the Marine Corps in December 7th of 1966? Well, at that period of time, uh, the country was getting heavily involved in, in the Vietnam War. And uh, through that escalation, it seemed like if you were uh, coming upon graduation from high school without plans to go into college, you probably were going to be drafted for two years in the Army. And I just, from listening to World War II stories from my grandfather and my father, who both served in the Navy, the one thing they talked about a lot was not the Navy, but about the Marines. They were just so impressed with what they had done, uh, especially on Iwo Jima, where both my father and grandfather served. So they they didn't push me in the Marine Corps, but they sure convinced me that if I was going to go to combat, this is the way I wanted to go. So rather than get drafted, I, I joined the Marine Corps. But it was it was with that knowledge that um, you know that that I I was going to get. Uh, the best training available. I was going to Vietnam. It just, it was just one of those things I knew was going to happen. So, and it did. So that's how I got there. Man, having a father and a grandfather both serve with the Navy during Iwo Jima, that, that's just incredible. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a real lineage. Uh, right. These gentlemen are true heroes. Uh, the notes here say that although you were first assigned to 1st Tank Battalion as part of 1st Marine Division, your early efforts were that of a provisional rifleman, uh, an infantryman, uh, while serving with the mem as a member of the security platoon. What was this like? Well, JR, I'll tell you, the reason that happened was it seemed like I was in a, a pipeline uh, uh, being expedited to Vietnam, you know, through recruit training, infantry training, tank school, staging battalion, which was like jungle warfare, and then right over to Vietnam, not even getting off uh, in Okinawa, but just got, so I thought certainly they probably had a tank parked there waiting for me for some reason. But when I got there, I found out that in fact, there was a lot of us uh, that had arrived recently uh, to replace tank crewmen that had either rotated or been killed or, or wounded in action. But so many of the tanks were mine damaged, they didn't have parts mm -hmm. for them. So what they did was they had a, a really, uh, probably about a 50 to 60 man uh, platoon at 1st Tank Battalion. And they uh, used us not only for security of the battalion headquarters, but uh, they also kind of farmed us out as extras uh, to reinforce other infantry units. And we did things like uh, um, uh, stay out on uh, uh, outposts, you know, further out from, from the Da Nang area. Uh, we uh, uh, watched and, and checked river traffic. Um, we were security on bridges. And we just did a whole host of, you know, nighttime patrols, building bunkers by day. You know, and this went on for about four months and I, I really had kind of given up hope uh, I thought that's how my tour was going to go. And, uh, and during that time, we saw limited action. Um, you know, at that time, you know, uh, the Viet Cong, uh, we were trying to find them. They were doing their best not to allow us to find them. They were putting out a lot of booby traps. They were firing mortars and rockets at night. Um, you know, a lot of mines uh, in the roads, you know, things like that. So, so they, were, they were active. We just couldn't quite get up with these guys. They're pretty elusive. Um, but then, then right after the first of the year, uh, I, I was told to uh, turn in my rifle and uh, get on the truck, and I headed out to uh, Charlie Company, first tanks. And when I got out to Charlie Company, uh, they told me I was assigned to the second platoon. Charlie Two Two was the vehicle I was assigned to, and all the suspension was gone on the left side. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so. With my, with only four weeks of tank school and then all this, you know, acting like a grunt thing, mm -hmm. uh, I looked at that and I said, holy crap, you know, <laughs> and there was a couple of other of us that got transferred out there. And, uh, you know, so we, we had a, a, one of the maintenance guys work with us on a daily basis. And of course, you know, we got the manuals out, we got all the tools out, got all the new parts out, which, you, you know, a tank parts, parts are like nothing weighs less than like a hundred pounds, you know, so, <laughs> right. so, so anyhow, but we, we did, uh, in fact, we re totally rebuild the suspension on the vehicle. You know, it was it was determined that the hull was not warped. So therefore, you know, you just rebuild it, put all new suspension on it. Next thing you know, you're off and going. Um, 
The so as part of as part of Charlie two two, were, were were you assigned as the driver initially? Actually, I started as a loader, like okay. everybody usually does. You know, I started as a loader. Um, you know, then after I, things kind of moved kind of quickly be, because you're not there with everyone you rotated with. You know, mm -hmm. so it's not like you come as a loader, and chances are you might be a loader for the full deployment. You know, but but things moved very rapidly, and and people you know rotated or something happened, you know, due to combat action. And the next thing you know, they're gone. And then it just seemed like everybody was uh, 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 capable of going from one vehicle to another also, you know, to, to reinforce a crew that now only had three, you know, so, 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 in the, so I did loading, then I did uh, driver, um, you know, and then uh, it wasn't until later on, I know we're going to get to Operation Allen book, that's when I became a tank commander. But, uh, but if I, if I back up a little bit, <clears throat> After I got out to Charlie Company, I was there for probably two weeks before the Tet Offensive started in 1968. And, and, and what happened was <clears throat> we didn't have the vehicle ready to go. So all vehicles that were uh, up and ready to go left with all the, I think we were with uh, 7th Marines at the time. So, so they basically, they, they left the CP and they left enough people behind to uh, set up a, a, a security for, for the base. Okay. But but it's, it's a primitive base. If we don't have any more, it's not a loss, okay? Mm -hmm. It's one of those, you know, really primitive. So anyhow, so they leave a whole bunch of us behind. What we do with the tanks, <clears throat> because they have like three or four tanks left that were mine damage. So what we do is we take the tank retriever and we drag these tanks around and put them in key positions, okay? So now <clears throat> we're all set up. We deal with it for about two or three days. And we're, we're concerned that there is uh, uh, an NVA uh, battalion coming our way. So we're thinking we're in for one heck of a fight. As it turns out, they totally bypass us. Their objective is actually the air station in Da Nang. Mm -hmm. so, so once they recognize that, then they tell us, we need you to abandon the base, get out ahead of these guys and stop them before they get to, uh, to Da Nang. So we do. Uh, there are a couple tanks that the, the uh, company commander and XO's tank are there. There's also a flame tank in maintenance and they said we need a driver for the flame tank and I could not help myself my hand just went up instantly you know I just wanted to do I just wanted to be involved right and, uh, so I said okay so you know I uh, these two marines I'd never met before in my life these two corporals they're up on top of the vehicle and I don't know if you've ever seen a flame tank but you know, they open up the top it's nothing but a big bottle inside next to the gunner holds about 300 gallons of napalm and you have to mix it so, so they're up there doing their mixing thing. <clears throat> I don't have a clue what's going on. I thought, maybe let me pay attention to the driver thing. So, you know, I'm checking suspension, you know, this, that, and everything, getting everything ready to go, checking oil, checking transmission. So, so anyhow, we get ready to pull out because we're supposed to be like hustling to do this. So we pull out. Sure enough, we leave. By the time we get out and get in front of this MBA battalion, it's dark. And, and they, the, the battalion, they move into a tree line. We set up kind of, you know, several hundred meters away, waiting for the first sunlight. And when that, when we get a little bit of light, we're on line and we're assaulting this uh, tree line. <clears throat> we're getting a lot of uh, help from the air station because obviously it's in their best interest to help us. So we are getting close air support. So we're, we're moving forward. Finally, the order comes up and says, what we want you to do is the flame tank advance to the tree line and go ahead and dump your whole load of napalm in there and light it off because we can see all these they're not they're kind of dug in but you can see everybody in the tree line mm. so we're like okay fine so we pull up there and, and 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 we just have all kinds of crap just bouncing off this tank and and they're in there and the gunner is spraying all the napalm and he goes to light it <clears throat> now we know why it's in for maintenance because none of the six igniters work oh. can't light the napalm right about oh. that time I'm looking through my vision block. I see a whole bunch of NVA run out in the tree line. And, and before I can say anything, they have set up a 57 recoilless rifle and have fired one round. Mm. And it hits, it hits right underneath where I'm sitting. <clears throat> so it hits the bow of the tank on the bottom. It's flex, you know, goes off and everything. Luckily, the gun tank sees it. They take them out. They never get a second shot. Okay. So that was... That was my first combat experience in a tank. <laughs> and I'll tell you, tanks are okay. Because <laughs> I, I, although I swear to God, it knocked me out and, and my eyes were embedded with, with uh, uh, dirt 
and, mm -hmm. and just you know it was it was it was it was an event but i survived the whole thing um so i guess the moral of the story here is you know if you're going to take a vehicle that's in maintenance find out why it's in there because <laughs> because although it wasn't funny at the time but i look back right. and i go at least somebody should have said why is this thing here mm -hmm. you know so, but anyhow that was that was my first combat experience um uh, after after that uh we did uh finish up charlie 2 2 and we started uh pretty much being on the road every, every day doing something uh with someone because uh we were assigned to like infantry companies we'd split the platoon in half and the heavy section would go with one company and the light section would go with another company uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, mine sweeps, um, security on bridges. We backed up um, the units that were inside the small uh, villages, the civil action patrol uh, or platoons, rather civil action platoons. Those uh, we reinforced them, and then uh, we we did uh, also uh, then participate in uh, Operation Allenbrook, which was. Uh, an offensive after after the Tet Offensive, which was their offensive, we started our own offensive. And uh, the, the 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 goal of Allenbrook was to go to an area called Gonai uh, Island, not really an island, but a piece of property that is uh, uh, segmented by rivers, so you could almost see where it kind of you, you got to cross the river to get out there, any way you look at it. But what they found was. There was, when the French were there back in the 50s, they had run a, a train through that area. They'd build a train, um, you know, and, and, and apparently uh, the North Vietnamese decided that that was great because when they got done, they took it all apart and they used all the, uh, the steel and the, the, the lumber to build an under, underground uh, bunker complex system that probably housed hundreds of people, wow. literally hundreds. And 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 it was and, and somebody figured out that they were out there, so they sent us in support of the 27th Marine Regiment, and they had just arrived in country. So there, there were there's some of those Marines had it was their second or third tour in Vietnam, but a lot of them were brand new too. And uh, so we we were there. It was a six week operation. Um, I like to talk to the Marines. <clears throat> At Paris Island, as I told you, I go down there periodically for the legacy program. And I always tell them about Operation Allen Book. And I go, you know, one of the things about that operation was, I said, the day we came back, we were wearing exactly the same clothes the day we left. Mm. Okay. W once we were out there two or three days, it became quite evident we could not conduct combat operations and shave. There's no place to get a haircut. Showers are out of the question. And I'm telling you, by the time you come back from an environment like that for six weeks, you're a different person, okay? You, you, I mean, you not only look different, smell different, feel different, it really changes your whole perspective on life, you know? And that's why after that experience, I always said, <clears throat> my gold standard for a wonderful day is not being shot at, not sleeping in the mud and getting fed. If those three things come true, I, you know, anything else that happens is a bonus after that, okay? But that's that that Ellen, that Operation Allenbrook was definitely the the most intense combat that I was in my time in Vietnam. The rest of it was kind of sporadic, but that six weeks it seemed like it was every day, all day, you know. And we went back and forth. So let's go back to the Tet Offensive for a second. Okay. Um, I know that I know that uh, we talked we talked about uh, the precursor to IEDs. And some of the booby traps that they were setting and whatnot. Um, so obviously, Tet Offensive was your first combat experience, and uh, in the flame tank, it was it was kind of challenging for for obvious reasons. What lessons did you learn though through that initial experience that helped you later with with that with the with the Apple, with the um, Allenbrook operation? I think the one thing that I really learned was you can you can never be overly prepared, okay, and you, and, and you, you and you can never anticipate something. I'm not even sure how to say this. You you can you can never anticipate the worst thing and and exaggerate it because it's going to come true, hmm. okay. It really is, um, you know, and. and I always have a hard time too when I when I go to Paris Town and I talk to Marines and and, and they want to know, you know, what what do you what do you feel inside? 
you know, when, when you're involved in combat. And I say, you know what? I don't really have a clue because I only remember being on the other side, which is that engagement's over. And, and all I know is I got to have a cigarette. That's all there is to it. It's, it's just, you know, and, and I, I got to take a break for a minute. I got to try and figure out, you know, are we okay? You know, what do we have to do if this whole thing starts over again in a couple of minutes? You know, we, we, we don't, you can't go home. Right. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's like, it's like that, you know, it's like the aboard ship. It's like they say out there, you know, everybody's got to be concerned about firefighting because if it starts on fire, you can't get off. You know, mm-hmm. you got, you got to work with it. And then combat is like that too. You, you, you don't have control of when you're going to be engaged and when the engagement is going to stop. You don't have any control over that. You know, the only thing you can do is, is if hopefully, like I say, after the Tet Offensive, that was like such an eye opener. Because up until then, we couldn't even find the enemy mm-hmm. to speak of, you know. Now, they're, they're there in uniforms in mass. You know, this is, this, is, this is like the combat that you saw on TV and you heard about. Mm-hmm. You know, it's actually happening now. So, you know, that, that was really an eye-opener. And I, and I, think, I think everybody really kind of took a new um, uh, look at how we do things day to day. You know, and and just minute to minute, right. you know, and, you know things such as, you know, when, when you have a break. I mean, the very first thing that we do, you know, we start, you know, inventory ammo. How much more do we need? You know, how are we doing on fuel? You know, do we have any damage to the vehicle? You know, do we need to clean any guns? Do we have time to clean guns? You know, the, and and you know what? What can we get done to be prepared? And then if we don't have to do anything, mm-hmm. then thank God we got a few minutes off. Mm-hmm. You know, and we can now now it's kind of like let's break out the sea rations and have something out of a can to eat, you know, and have a cigarette and you know, and, and maybe 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 even catch, you know, a 15, 20 minute nap. Because I that's the one thing I, I know that, that always comes up too, you know. And I said, I I swear to God, my tour in Vietnam was a series of cat naps, you know. <laughs> I I I even even I, even the one night that we're supposed to, supposed to come into the rear, it was kind of a cycle we were in every week when we come back for one day and do maintenance and, and we'd be able to, you know, spend the night in the CP. Even even the night we, we were there, we got hit. I'm like, mm-hmm. what? You know, nobody nobody gives you a break, you know? So, uh, but yeah. How, I, how far was Ganoe Island from from where you were with the Tet Offensive? Can you can you set the stage so so Tet, so, so, so you pull off Tet, how far yeah. how far of a road march was that and and what was the composition of, of of the unit at that point okay well first of all i think the 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 point to look at on the map is probably da nang okay because you know you have for the marine area it starts at chulai and that's mm-hmm. south and then you come up as da nang and after that it's way and once once you go north away then then you get to kan chin and and the dmz you know that that's marine area that's mm-hmm. that's I Corps, okay, and and then everything else south of that's all army, you know. So yeah. we, as, as usual, we get always the best spots, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so we're we're right, and these guys are are either coming across the border from the DMZ or they're going uh, doing an end around down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and they're they're coming in from Laos or Cambodia, mm-hmm. you know. So so the I Corps is is the area where you know you really they 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 are really upset because you're there. You know, and, and they, they really want to do the same thing they did to the French. Um, so so that that area. So we're we're west of Da Nang, probably about, you know, about, I, I would gather about uh, maybe 10 to 15 miles, you know, west west of Da Nang uh, in an area that is known as the uh, the rocket belt. And the reason they refer to it as the rocket belt is because that's where the North is bringing all their uh, rockets to. And then they're firing into Da Nang, the airstrip, because the airstrip is a combination of Air Force and Marines. And it, mm. they not only provide a lot of close air support, but they have uh, lots of fighter squadrons. Those fighter squadrons are providing uh, 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 security for B-52s that are going up North. Plus, they're also engaging MIGs once they cross over the DMZ. So, so for the North, they like, if you can put Da Nang out of business, you know, we can, you know, stop this bombing of the North and, and, you know, we can, you know, really, you know, take control because I will tell you during the war that, 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 you know, especially like on Operation Albrook, you know, uh, the, the close air support uh, is not overrated. I'll tell you that. Okay. I mean, artillery is great. 
don't get me wrong, you know, if you can, you know, call in artillery, you know, that's, that's totally awesome. You know, the close air support, I don't know, there's something about it, um, you know, because those guys actually have eyes on you mm -hmm. and eyes on where they want to put that ordinance. So, so they're more involved, you know, than, than the artillery guys are They're, I mean, granted, they're, they're doing their computations, they do an awesome job, can't complain, you know, but still uh, the close air support, you know, so um, that that part, you know, is is probably what will save the day for us. Both oh. and, what was the and composition of the company? The, the company usually um, is if you're talking about the, the you know, company of infantry and then the support of tanks. Is that kind of right? Really how, how, many, how many tanks did you have with with the? Tank. No, usually, usually we would go either the heavy section three or the light section two per company, okay. and the come, but it just depended because there there were times like on Allenbrook we we had uh, twelve tanks okay out there we reinforced uh, part of uh, uh, fifth tank battalion they had a, a platoon out there of five and then mm -hmm. we brought out uh, five, our platoon came out there from Charlie Company there's ten then we also had. Uh, a blade tank and a flame tank with us. And are you moving online or, or how, how are you progressing uh, well, against the enemy? Normally, well, if we're, if we're in route, we are, uh, we're, we're following one another mm. and we're, we're, we take turns because there's so many mines out there that we just take turns in hopes that when our turn comes up, we lead the rest of the tanks through an area where you do not set off a mine. Okay. okay. Now, now the the, the little um, uh, grenades and 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 punji sticks and all these other little things that are mostly for infantry. Of course, we're just mowing those things over. So it's mm -hmm. no big deal, you know. So every once you'll you'll hear a grenade go off or something, but but it's you know it's, it's not even annoying. It's just the grunts are thrilled, you know, that you that you did that, um, you know. So we usually that's how we travel. When when it's time to in, engage. We're usually online because it, it, the, even the bunker complexes, they, they intentionally let the area grow over. So it's like uh, big areas of elephant grass and then tree lines. And then the tree lines are where the bunker complexes are. Hmm. And, and elephant grass, if you've never experienced it before, <clears throat> when you look out across the elephant grass and you're online, the only thing you see of the other tanks is the tank commander and the antennas. Okay. That's why they call it elephant grass because you can literally lose elephants in there. Mm. I swear to God, it, it's it's amazing, but it, but it's scary too, you know, because because I, I I know that one our 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 platoon leader Lieutenant Williams uh, was killed uh, on Operation Allenbrook. Mm -hmm. He was shot uh, by a sniper who was up in the trees. Okay. And we, we had no idea there were snipers up there, none. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, you, you've seen the picture of Charlie 2-2. Uh, it has a, a sky-mounted M60 machine gun. Mm -hmm. And we were advancing into a tree line. He was up there, you know, firing the machine gun. And somehow the round hit like right underneath his arm, you know, and it mm -hmm. severed his aorta. And he just died just like that. He was dead. But... But the point is that uh, we didn't realize those snipers were up there and then come to find out later that they, they kind of look forward to the Marines coming online through the elephant grass because when, when they started returning fire and everybody hit the deck, the snipers could very easily see the Marines lying out there in the elephant grass. You know, mm. it's pretty easy to start picking them off. So, uh, you know, but once, I mean, we, you know, you only get fooled one time. You know, after that, you know, as we would move towards the tree line, we would fire canister rounds into the trees, into the treetops, you know, just to make sure, you know, if anybody was up there, we, we cleared them out. Um, how how long did Allen Brook last? That lasted six weeks. That wow. was six, yeah, six weeks. And the final, the, we, we, we lost approximately 200 Marines and corpsmen. I, I couldn't give you the breakdown, but there were there were at least one uh, Congressional Medal of Honor and certainly lots of other awards. Uh, enemy dead, uh, confirmed dead, which means you have a body and a, and a weapon, hmm. uh, 995. Uh, when we finally secured the island, then the Navy sent uh, a, a platoon of Seabees out there 
And what they did was they went down into, well, the Marines had gone down there and, and cleared out the, the bunker complexes. Mm -hmm. Then, then, then the, the CBs went down there and then they, they uh, set explosives and, and they imploded the whole complex, mm -hmm. you know, they just destroyed it. Um, you know, so af after, after that, um, the remainder of my time, I had another, uh, like, month and a half two months in country before i rotated and and that that time was spent uh doing a lot of uh uh bridge security and then every morning we'd go and uh we would provide support for the engineers as they would sweep the main roads because everything there is is all dirt mm -hmm. you know there's there's no well i did see some paved roads but it was rare most of the ones that that our convoys would go over were all hard packed so it was possible in the middle of the night for, for the NDA or the VC to get out there and put mines in the road. Mm. So that meant that every day, every piece of that uh, for the convoys heading out of Da Nang, which was also a large harbor, uh, the, the, the convoys running uh, north out of Da Nang to go to, you know, the Way, Kanchin, and all of those places up to the DMZ to resupply Marines. You know, we had to sweep all the, that road, you know, every, so there was not only us, but there are other platoons at different locations to help sweep the roads early in the morning, you know, and get them clear so the convoys could, you know, start going through. So that's, that's kind of what I did. And then I, I headed back to the States, thank God. So. So your, your company commander rec recognized you personally by saying that your outstanding leadership as a tank commander under trying conditions of almost daily contact with the enemy is appreciated. I mean, that, that sentence right there says a lot about that operation and, and exactly what you went through. Um, cause daily contact with the enemy. I mean, that's, especially for six weeks, that's, uh, that's really something. Right. Well, when, when, <clears throat> when Lieutenant Williams was killed, um, and we, we backed out of there and got, got his body out in our, uh, our tank commander, uh, was WA. So he was medevaced also. And that left myself and, and my very good friend, Lenny Mendez, uh, the gunner. And we said, uh, okay, we got to get back in the fight here. So, uh, uh, we did. Um, uh, I drove. He gunned. We, you know, kept on with the assault. It was kind of limited because, as you can imagine, you know, if the machine gun jams, we got to back out. You know, because he's like a one band band in the turret. Right. But, but after a couple of days, uh, they sent us two replacements, and they actually came from 27th Marines. Wow. And and they were tank crewmen. And what had happened was when they put the 27th Marine Regiment together to go to Vietnam was such a hustle that anyone that was that they didn't need, they just pulled out of the units and made O3s. Mm -hmm. So they took a lot of tank crewmen with them. So we actually got two real tank crewmen with us wow. through a four. And then I, I took over as the tank commander. So I was for the rest of my time there, you know, on Operation Elmbrook. And then after that, I was a tank commander. So, okay. so I did that, I guess, for probably two or three months. I was a tank commander. So, And then it says here that your assignments continued with 2nd Tank Battalion, uh, where you went out on uh, Mediterranean cruise with uh, th uh, th 3rd Battalion's uh, 6th Marine Regiment. Right. Um, what, what were these cruises like back then? Well, 2nd uh, Tank Battalion was, when I got there, uh, after my tour in Vietnam, surprisingly, was extremely busy, okay? Mm -hmm. They had uh, uh, two, two, com two companies of uh, uh, M48s, and they had one company of, I want to say it was the M103, I might be off on the number, but it was, a, it was a tank that looked very much like the M48, with the exception of the gun, it was huge. It was a 120 millimeter gun, really mm -hmm. long. And it was, uh, I guess, a, a regular anti, I guess it's the tank you want to be in if you're going to battle a Russian tank, I guess. Yeah. So, but anyway, that, those, that company uh, kept a platoon down Guantanamo Bay. Hmm. So, so that was that, so they're, they're busy keeping Marines going back and forth Guantanamo. The other two companies, what we were doing was supporting uh, uh, cruises, active cruises ongoing in both the Caribbean and then one in the Mediterranean. So we, at any given time, you'd have at least a couple of platoons on, well, you'd have maybe as many as four platoons on float because you've got mm. some going over or some coming back. And, mm. you know, so we, we did that. Uh, we spent uh, six months in the Mediterranean. We did uh, quite a few amphibious landings. 
Hmm. Um, I always like to talk to the, the Marines at Paris Island about shipboard life because it's a different life. Uh, it you, sure is. Something you got to get used to, you know. <laughs> takes takes a little getting used to, but some of the things I I think about, you know, I mean, I mean, first of all, you, you have just enough room to lay down to sleep, and and that's it, okay. And and the and the and the floor is now foot lockers instead of steel. Okay, so that's kind of how you're living, or you're living out of a sea bag. You know. Mm -hmm. So the other thing, as far as being a tank crewman, we were aboard World War II type ships. So they would they would have a, put together. It was like I think six or seven ships and different mm -hmm. types that they used for for their landings in World War II. These things are still going. So we're uh, we have our our tanks on. Uh, LCUs, the landing boats, but the boats are in the well deck of an LSD. Mm. Uh, so, so anyhow, so it's it's kind of a nice setup, you know. And the, and the sailors are okay, and they give us good food, and <laughs> we we try and perform maintenance on the tanks. But the problem is, they don't want us to start the tanks up, right? Okay, they, because what they're saying is these fumes. There's no place for these fumes to go, and we're saying, well, we can't go weeks without starting these because by that time the batteries would be dead we'd go to make an amphibious landing we can't even get off the damn boat you know right. we had to come up with kind of a compromise on that you know to, to actually start the engines let them run mm -hmm. the amphibious landings uh are, i i mean my, my eyes were wide open i'm telling you on that first one it's it's very it's a interesting process mm -hmm. you know because <clears throat> what they want is they want everything uh out uh, all the landing craft out and circling and preparing to hit the beach at first light. So that means, you know, you're in the mess hall about zero three, uh, getting something to eat, and then it's down to get on the LCU and the, and the main ship ballast down so those can float out. Mm -hmm. And then they start circling. And of course, you're in the dark, you know, you don't really see anything. <clears throat> and then, of course, when you start getting to where you can see some light now, everybody is, is getting pretty excited. And uh, we're all getting in our positions and, uh, aboard the tank, you know, and, and, and now the gun's out of travel lock and it's paint, pointed forward. And mm -hmm. we don't have any ammo, but, you know, but we're, we're going to do what we would normally do if we were, in fact, making uh, an actual assault on an enemy beach. Mm -hmm. You know, so this, this is real. And, uh, and, and when, you, when you pull in, uh, you hope that all your seals are really going to work because you don't know this is your first amphibious landing. <laughs> You're kind of hoping all the seals are going to work. Um, but, but we had put new seals in before we left. So we're, we're pretty comfortable. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you have a uh, special uh, fording gear on the mm -hmm. tank, which is going to allow it to grab air and, you know, shoot the exhaust out, you know, hopefully above the water level. And then, then the only last thing you have to do is hope that they can get in far enough to where you, when you drive off, you don't get, totally submerged you right. know uh so when you come off the end of it it's just like uh you know i was i was the driver when we first went out there so i was like i just put my foot to the floor and you know by god we came back up on the beach we were fine <laughs> so uh well, the yeah the amphibious landing cycle is is uh is pretty interesting and mm -hmm. uh you know after i did it the first time i was like oh we can do this all day long now <laughs> you know it's just that first time you're just a little apprehensive right. you know but now the, the there in the Amtraks that just come zipping off the end of that lst out in the middle of nowhere you know and, and they go down underneath and then they magically come back up to the surface and make mm -hmm. it to the beach now those guys uh, good for them that's what i say yeah yeah <laughs> you know, that, that that really i was i was skeptical of that but um yeah the amphibious landings uh once we did the first one we we were good to go we did operate with uh some of our NATO partners, so sometimes language was an issue, mm. um, you know, but, but, you know, we always, you know, I, I guess, you know, you're there for a common purpose, you know, so, you, you, you know, you kind of make do and, and everybody learns a little bit, you know, and uh, it turns out fine. So, uh, yeah, I did, I did enjoy that, uh, the six months, I shouldn't say I enjoyed it. I, I, I had a pretty good time, you know, it wasn't bad. I, I wasn't one of those that took to sea life right away. I, I, mm. I did about three weeks of uh, I'm seasick until we get mm. to the other side of the Atlantic. <laughs> but after that, I was fine, you know. It just took a little while. Oh, yeah. And always, always mark all your clothes, you know. Mm. Make sure you use the right markers <laughs> because, <laughs> because if you don't, your stuff goes to the ship laundry. And if it's not marked properly, chances are it's never coming back, right. you know. There's nothing worse than being aboard ship. 
and and only having one pair of underwear to wear and one to wash. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> well, I say going aboard ship is different, but I think you know we all things considered, you know, I, I think we did extremely well as a unit, and we were very effective and, and efficient. And like I say, the only the only real obstacle was not being able to just go down every day and fire the vehicle up and let the thing sit on. You know, it, that, that to me was the only real problem, you know, the, that I, right. the, and, and we just had to tell the Navy, we just have to do this. So they, they you know, they, they gave us a time frame and they just evacuated, they told people not to be in certain working spaces. Mm -hmm. right, you know, so. What, what year did you go to recruiting duty in Rochester, New York? Oh, I went on recruiting duty in 1970. Um, and it was uh, right after I came back from the med cruise. In fact, that was the next thing I did. We did a couple of things. We did a couple of uh, uh, Manos, the battalion did, uh, you know, down to Georgia. We couldn't live fire at Camp Lejeune at the time. Not sure why, but mm -hmm. they used to, we'd load our tanks up on uh, rail flat cars and we'd mm -hmm. take them and uh, spend a few weeks out using army ranges and then come back. But, but then uh, I decided that uh, I think I wanted to re-enlist. I was pretty happy, having a pretty good time. And I, and I had been promoted to sergeant. Uh, you know, that only, you know, that was, that happened pretty fast too. Promotions were very fast. It was kind of like if, if, you, if you survive, you're gonna get promoted, you know, because it just that's the way it was. I, I think it took me like, you know, I was two years and three months and I was wow. a sergeant. I was just, it was, you know, so at the three-year point, I decided to re-enlist and uh, I selected recruiting duty in opposed mm -hmm. to DI duty, which later on I went, this was a mistake, but it's too late now. Mm -hmm. So I did do three and a half years on recruiting duty um, in Rochester, New York, which is my hometown. So uh, it turned out to be a, a fairly decent experience, but some of the problems were uh, at the time, the, uh, the draft was uh, still in effect, but they had gone to a lottery system. Hmm. So, so people were not really willing to join thinking they're going to get drafted because it's a lottery. Let's just wait and see what happens, you hmm. know. And also, there's lots of uh, anti-war protesters and protests going on. Um, uh, I, I think people truly had tired of, of the war. And in a lot of the suburban high schools, they finally uh, asked us not to come back. Wow. Yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was a very trying time. <clears throat> um, still, you know, even even in the worst of times, though, there are those young men and women that just have it in their mind they're going to be a Marine. Mm -hmm. You know, so so we so I you know I continued uh, on with my you know pretty steady flow of enlistments you know mm -hmm. throughout the three and a half years. So uh, in fact, just every once in a while, I'll run into somebody who I enlisted. It's kind of a a strange reunion, you know, <laughs> thinking right. that, that far back, you know, and here, you know, here we are today. Um, but of course, my Marine recruiter only lives in the next town. So I do see him every, every year on the Marine Corps birthday, we get together for breakfast. So, but, uh, but anyhow, yeah, I did the recruiting duty and, and then uh, I was off to uh, third tank battalion. And, and by that time they had left Vietnam, they were on Okinawa. Okay. When I got there <clears throat> and I reported in. And, uh, um, and, and I, I, I liked being there. Um, you know, we, we were able to um, uh, mostly do maintenance, it seemed. We didn't have access uh, to any firing ranges on Okinawa. Um, so as far as getting out and operating, it was limited opportunities. Every once in a while, they would allow us to go out, but we would have to go out in the middle of the night because in order to get to the training area, we had to use one of the, the main roads so it was like we get a police escort. If you can see this tank tank platoon with a police escort at two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> rumbling and, down the street, you know. And I'm sure everybody's awake. You know, how could right. you five tanks just drove by your house, right? Right. So yeah, we we head out to the northern training area and and you know and operate for a few days and come back. So it was it was it was okay. Um, I was put in a platoon that was going to go on on float uh, eventually, and mm -hmm. I started with a training cycle. I didn't end up going with them because my, my, my time expired. But one of the things I did do with them was we went to uh, Mount Fuji, Japan for cold weather training. Mm -hmm. and we got there shortly after Christmas and we stayed there basically until Easter. Wow. Uh, and I'm, and I'm, from, <clears throat> I'm from Western New York, so I'm thinking to myself, 
cold and snow, eh, no big deal. I've lived mm-hmm. through that. I have to tell you that Mount Fuji is a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They get, they get their, like it's the Rocky Mountains, they get their snow in feet. You know, mm-hmm. they don't, they don't get like six inches of snow. They don't mm-hmm. even talk about that. But yeah, you might get several feet of snow. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, some of, we, I, I got to admit though, it was some awesome training. It really was. Uh, we had a lot of ranges available to us. We got to do a, a lot of, uh, and, and we, we, although there were infantry up there too, going through cold weather training, but we never really did much with the infantry units. Okay. We, we just did a lot of tank training. That's mm-hmm. what we, I'll tell you, it was, it was great. And we, when we went out to a range, we would be out there for like a week to 10 days. Um, these tanks M48s or M60s? M48s. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's so we're, so we go out to the range. We're out there for about a week to 10 days. Um, we set up uh, tents <clears throat> and we live out of tents, no heaters, because that because there had been um, in a Marine Corps tent that had a heater, a fire and Marines were killed. Mm. So they just said that that's it. Just no heaters. <clears throat> and really, it, once you live out there for a while, it, it's not bad. It's mm-hmm. not, you know, um, you know, of course, you know, when you got to go to the two holder and you got to scoop snow off the scoop of things so you now that that's a little inconvenient but you know besides that the rest the rest of the life out there is pretty good um and once you get used to the cold it's it's just not a big deal it really is mm-hmm. in fact when we would go above 30 it was almost like oh my god it's warm out you know that, mm-hmm. that had gone up uh the tanks did did well in the snow they weren't mm-hmm. great you know but they did well um in other words if if you're going you know, in a straight line, not a problem. If you got to climb a hill, maybe not so much. Mm-hmm. You might have to take like an angle in order to get where you want to go. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we did have one snowstorm that <clears throat> when we got done and dug ourselves out so we could go to the tank park, we looked down there because it was kind of downhill and all we could see were antennas. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> and and not, not one of them fired up. So thank God mm-hmm. the retriever did. So we used the retriever to fire them all off, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was good training though. The hard thing was, uh, getting the platoon out about every two or three days, marching them down to the showers and making them take showers hmm. because the water was never warm. <laughs> it, it, was, it was almost like taking a shower with a slushy machine. Hmm. So <laughs> I, was, I was a young staff sergeant at the time. So I would go in and go, look, this is not a big deal. Okay. You can do this, you know? And I'm thinking I, I am freezing. Okay, but, I, I, but I've got all these, you know, sergeants and corporals, right. grand corporals right. looking at me on them. I'm, I'm like, you guys can do this, you know, but you you cannot go without showers. Mm-hmm. You, know, you got to get cleaned up. You know? right. So I, that that was that was uh, probably the, the challenge. Okay, mm-hmm. and then in the spring they don't allow the units to rotate out until the snow's all gone because the the Japanese uh, they just. Mount Fuji to them is, is just a sacred place. Mm. So what we have to do is we have to go and we have to get online and sweep every one of those ranges we fired on looking for duds. Wow. And so what we do is while we're, we know it's going to happen. So while we're out there firing during the winter, you've got a spotter for every tank. Mm-hmm. Okay. And watching to make sure that round exploded. Mm. Cause it didn't, if for some reason it went out there and bounced, you're like, Oh, we're on this range this day, mm. fired an HE round or heat or whatever it was, didn't see an explosion. So mm. it's sort of like, okay, we're gonna have to go out and look for that one. Um, but yeah, one, once we we uh, you know cleared it and everything, and then we went we went back to ok- Okinawa after mm. that. So and then as a staff sergeant, uh, the Marine Corps played a uh, rather interesting uh, trick on you, where it took a Marine Corps tanker, staff and CO type. And uh, it says here, retrained you as an avion- avionics. Uh, yeah. What Avi- what uh, what what happened here? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what happened was in in the early seventies, the Marine Corps was going through a lot of problems, both racial issues. It was just it was it, it was not good. Race relations were horrible in the Marine Corps, and the other thing was we were getting infiltrated by drugs. Hmm. Lots of drug use. I mean, just, I mean, it, it was, you almost could see it happening, you know? Mm. And and I just, I was due for reenlistment and, and Captain called me in and said, you're going to reenlist? And I said, I don't think so. Mm. You know, I said, I, I think I've had it, 
you know, the, the days of being a Marine, you know, and, and, and being respected for, you know, your rank and, you know, and all the, those things, you know, and, and the drugs. And I said, I, I just don't think so, Captain. I said, I, I think I've had it. I think I'm, you know, you can send me back, you know, my orders could be to wherever in the U.S. and I'm, I'm just going to call it quits. And he said, you know, I got a friend at headquarters Marine Corps. He said, there's a program uh, where you can retrain in a different MOS. You know, maybe that's what you need is just a change of environment, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, so I said, well, I'll, I'll give us some thoughts. So they, a few weeks later, because, you know, back then there's no texting, there's no Internet, you know, you don't, you don't get right. information that quick. So a few weeks go by, he gives me this what, big printout. He says, go through here and pick out which one of these MOSs, because they said you're qualified for all these MOSs. And it was a lie. And I went through there, and how I finally deciphered that, that I would go to avionics was it had the longest schools. And I just assumed the longest schools equated to the best education. And if I was going to make a change into, you know, a, a technical field, I, I wanted to get the best you know, more bang for the bucks. So I said, sure, if you'll put me in avionics, I'll go ahead and run this and came back approved. So off to Millington, Tennessee, I went. And I was there for the better part of a year going through some basic aviation schools and then a lot of the avionics and then electronics and, and went off to a couple of Navy schools at, uh, um, oh shoot, I'm trying to think of the name of the base. Oh, oh. But anyhow, it doesn't make a difference. So, so it was about a year's worth of training before I actually before I got stationed at uh, Cherry Point. North well, at, well, at Cherry Point, you you served with the Marine Air Group uh, 14, on, right on the on Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point. Um, so what? So you obviously had a reason for leaving tanks, um, and, and we're looking for that new start. What was it like, though, transitioning from a tank unit to the air wing? Well, um, first of all, you don't wear combat boots. Everybody wears safety shoes, so mm -hmm. they're not bloused. That's the first thing I noticed. Second thing was, it seemed like everybody had more hair. <laughs> Those are the two things I noticed. But for the most part, you know, Marines are Marines. You know, we're still running PFTs. We're still going to the rifle pistol range, you know, and all that. And at the same time, trying to keep uh at the at the time uh marine air group 14 was uh all a6 intruder aircraft uh so you know keeping those things going and uh, lots of deployments um around the world board ship you know a lot going on you know real busy place uh pretty much a 24 7 type operation you know so uh there's there's three shifts going on you know days nights mids and then there's what they call duty section which is you're assigned to one of four duty sections. So every weekend the duty section works. So every fourth weekend you're gonna to work too. So you work seven days. So so it was it was more time than being a tank crewman, that's for sure. You know, it just because I remember being at Camp Lejeune and I know that Friday mornings was inspection. And if the barracks and the tank park passed, you're on your merry way by noontime for the weekend. You know, it was it was it was it was pretty nice. Right. Um, you know, where Cherry Point was pretty high, high uh uh, operation tempo, you know, mm. I rather enjoyed being there. Uh, the one thing I noticed that they did have the tendency to do uh, using myself, and then there were some other staff on the COs that had to retrain uh, from uh, the ground side, you know, not necessarily tanks, but from, from different MOSs to aviation. I noticed what every time there was going to be an inspection, you know, the uh, the IG team is coming or, or something like that's going to happen. They always called us up and we were like the, the, the go-to team, you know, to make sure that everybody's uniforms and the barracks and, you know, the list goes on and on, you know, can they march, can they fire, can they run a PFD, you know, mm -hmm. all those basic Marine things, you know, to make sure that, uh, uh, that they passed. So that was kind of interesting. You know, I, I mean, I appreciated the fact that, you know, that they, you know, picked me out. Right. Um, I, I started going on deployments, uh, and it was, it was very much like uh, being in the tank platoon. You know, you realize once you're gone, you can't go back and get what you forgot. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was really a lot of planning, a lot of attention to detail, making sure you have everything that you need. Um, you know, I, I know one time I had my, my fitness report uh, being reviewed by the warrant officer I worked for. And, uh, and he told me, I was like, just like outstanding. Everything's outstanding. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, well, how do I rank? And I, but I didn't rank near the top of all the other staff sergeants, you know? Mm -hmm. 
said, how could that be? I'm the guy that goes on all the deployments and works nights and mids and all this other stuff. He goes, well, he said, the other ones, um, he said, to tell you the truth, they're involved in off-duty education and that's why they're, they're ahead of you. So that was my next goal. <laughs> that, right. that was it. That's why I did uh, take advantage of going to school on weekends and evenings. And it took me five years to go from uh, a zero to an MBA, but I did it right there at Cherry Point. And uh, they, I was just thankful that at the Joint Education Building that they had a variety of colleges and universities available that you could go to, you know. So, uh, so I, I, you know, I took care of that deficit right away. <laughs> Who doesn't want to be number one, right? So I figured, you know, <laughs> right. if all these things I'm doing are, are, are so grand and outstanding, you know, why am I not number one? And, and that was the only reason that he could give me. So I was like, okay, off to school then. But, uh, but yeah, it was, it was interesting making the move to, 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 uh, to aviation. They still had uh, some problems like the ground side did during the during the early 70s with race r- relations and with drugs they still did but it wasn't as as pronounced I think because the aviation marines were maybe uh, a little higher skill uh, a little higher education and they worked a lot more and, and I think if you keep marines busy you right. don't have a problem because I know a lot of times even associated with a Vietnam tour a lot of people are like, oh yeah, you know, Vietnam must smoke a lot of dope. I was like, what are you talking about? Hmm. Where does that come from? You right. know, maybe the guys in the rear, you know, maybe that, maybe they had time on their hands and they were going to town and smoking dope and all the rest of that. But I'm telling you what, combat marines don't have time for that silly stuff. Right. You, know, you just don't. You know. You talked about uh, striving and and maintaining that that marineism, and uh, you did that all the way through to your retirement. Um, in 1986, as a master sergeant, um, which each each time each, each billet you increased your responsibility and in, uh, and your leadership, but it didn't stop there, because uh, you you've really kind of dedicated your life to main, maintaining the Marine Corps standards, um, to include uh, in 2016 when you uh, when you ran the uh, the Marine Corps Marathon, um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, the 41st. JR, I went that 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 fall. I was, we were invited back to Fort Benning, which we had been to tank school earlier on that year. We were invited back uh, by the CEO. He said, "If you'd like to come to the Marine Corps ball, we have a fantastic ball here," which they did. It was like hundreds of people come, and uh, so we went back to the ball. and 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 they had their guest speaker was a major general from headquarters Marine Corps, and he was there to speak about. Uh, uh, who, who, who were the Marines at Iwo Jima that raised the flag, you know, about that controversy and everything, right? So anyhow, so we go to the ball and of course I, you know, I've got my blues on and everything and, and I get introduced to the general and he said, I hear you ran the Marine Corps Marathon. I said, yes, sir, I did, you know? I said, it was, it was one of the best days of my life. I really enjoyed it. He said, why did you do it? I said, sir, I said, it's the only other Marine Corps emblem on the planet that you can earn. And I could see it all of a sudden, you could see in his face that he was thinking, oh my God, he's right, you know? Mm. And I think for me, it was a recognition of my 50th anniversary of joining the Marine Corps, which I never thought that, who would think, you know, that you 50 years later, put on your running shoes and go do a marathon. But right. it was just, you know, it was just, the, but if you've ever seen that uh, emblem, the, I mean, not the emblem, but the medal mm. that you receive at the at the marathon, the, the Marine Corps emblem. It's it's just totally awesome, mm. and and the world and the, the world part opens up, and inside is the Iwo Jima Memorial. I mean, it's it's just, you know. But there's only way you can only one way you can get one of those. You right. know, you have to make that twenty six point two, which like I told you before, of course I. Have, I have pictures of me in the morning smiling. I have me later on in the day being treated for heat. <laughs> <laughs> but by that, I had my medal. <laughs> so yeah, it was. It, but but it was it was a, it was one of the best days I had because the, the entire twenty six point two, even when it started getting really hot and muggy, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh my god, um, there were Marines almost every inch of the way, mm-hmm. and, and I thought to myself they're not going to let anything bad happen to me. So I'm just going to keep moving as long as I can move. And I will drink everything they put out, which I did. And uh, they even some, some, there were ladies hanging out ice cubes and things like mm-hmm. that. 
couple of fire departments have set up spray places when you run through you got sprayed mm -hmm. it, it it all paid off and then yeah. and at the end the the lieutenant that i had met in the morning uh from from uh quantico that was there just they had like every i think every tbs student was there that morning and in in uniform and uh, I spoke to him in the morning and, and, and we talked for quite a while. And, and when it got ready to start, he said, I'll see you later. And I said, okay, I didn't think I, when I was heading up to the Iwo Jima Memorial and there's like uh, probably about 50 shoots, you go through any one of these 50 shoots on the way up. Mm -hmm. And at the end, there's a Marine there that, that gives you your, your medal. And, and as I started up that hill, and I, I mean, I was wore out, and I looked up at that and everything, and I saw somebody jumping up and down <laughs> like a wild man. It was that lieutenant. Oh, and that's cool. <laughs> so, yeah. So I went up there and he, he put the metal on me and everything. I was like, I told him, I said, God almighty, I said, am I tired? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So somebody that uh, has, uh, has obviously had just a tremendous career, 20 year career. Um, early on through Vietnam, uh, through multiple combat operations, a change of an MOS. What message do you have for, for today's Marines and, and in particular today's tankers? Right, well, I, I, you know, when I look back at all that, um, you know, I see some, some, some basics, you know, that, that you just need to focus on. And, and you know, it's that, uh, what they used to call like the, the total Marine uh, concept, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta look at yourself. You know, and, and you got to stay squared away and you got to stay in great physical condition. And, you know, you got to really focus when you go to the rifle range and the pistol range, mm -hmm. you know, and, and your uniforms have to be, you know, just in, in, in awesome shape. You know, just I mean, if you look at the basics, you know, then I think, you know, not only will you have confidence, but you'll be ready. And I think the Marines around you will sense that. And I hope you sense that of them. OK. Mm -hmm because it is only through that team that we can be successful and survive, okay? If, 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 if you don't pay attention to the basics, you know, certainly you're gonna have a bad day, I think, so. And talking about the basics, I'm gonna ask you to tell one more story. Um, and this story kind of came about because I was doing some, uh, some prep work for this interview and I saw your interview um, as part of the, uh, uh, Vietnam Tankers Association interviews that you had done um, some time ago. And uh, uh, that, that interview in particular talks about Private First Class Friesen and uh, really the, um, the mistake, I mean, you use the word mistake, that was made uh, with regards to uh, his untimely passing uh, in Vietnam. And you kind of took it upon yourself to, to right that wrong um, as somebody that uh, knew you had a uh, knew you had a purpose, uh, not only for, for, for him as a Marine, but also to the family to make sure that that, that mistake was, was righted, uh, which, I, which you ultimately did. But um, can you tell us that story before we, before we part here? Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, PSC Fryson uh, was a cook by MOS. And uh, this, this point in time is during the Tet Offensive. And uh, we were uh, for a few weeks uh, our platoon was supporting the Second Republic of Korea uh, Marine Brigade uh, in Hoi An. And, and uh, the importance of Hoi An as a small town, uh, they had a, a CP where the Koreans were. They also had an outpost uh, area called the Mud Flats. And then they had a little airport to provide security. Um, and it was, I could not tell you, I, I think it's a CIA operation, but anyhow, it's old planes and guys flying them for some reason, but but anyhow, it's high security. So so we're there, and we're out to the airstrip, and um, we broke a torsion bar uh, on one of our daily sweeps, and so we had to get it fixed. So they scheduled us to come in early one morning, drive into the Korean CP. Uh, our maintenance guy, Dick Lawrence, would be there, and he would help us change out the torsion bar. So I thought, great. So we pulled in and met Dick, and uh, it was just our crew and one other crew who was following us. We always travel in pairs. And uh, so one of the things that we wanted to do while we were there was all of our personal gear was kept there. And uh, we wanted to get in and, and get our, our mail. And uh, so I, I ran into the, 
uh, the, the, the hut where our platoon leader and all those folks were. I said, uh, we're just here to get a torsion bar fix. We want to grab the mail. And they said, not a problem. Said, but the, we had to lock up uh, where your gear is because we had some problems with somebody going in there and going through your stuff. So, okay. So PSC Fryson, who I'd never met before, <clears throat> um, he said, I'll unlock it for you. It's not a problem. And of course, we're just like, he's a PSC, I'm a Lance Corporal, we're just, we're just Marines, you know. So he and I and Lenny Mendez, we walked from one hut to the next. And we're introducing ourselves and, and he's telling us, oh yeah, I'm from Chicago and I'm the cook. And you know, if you want me to make you something special before you go back out, you know, I can make you this, I can make you that. Really, really nice kid, right? We're getting along fine. I said, okay, great. So we, he, op he unlocks the door to the hut, opens the door to the hut. Lenny steps in, I step in, there's a huge explosion. I'm like, what the? And, 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 and Lenny and I dove through the back door to get out of the, out of the hut and start heading to get back on our tank, we had assumed it was incoming. It wasn't, it was the booby trap on the door and, and Fryson, he opened the door for us and it must have been a grenade because we couldn't have been inside three to five seconds and that thing went off. So anyhow, we get outside, Dick Lawrence is already there putting tourniquets on him, the lieutenant's calling the medevac. A few minutes later, the helicopter picks him up, he's gone, okay? so. So my time with him is probably like meeting somebody at a bus stop, all right? Just a few seconds, just, just enough to, 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 you know, introduce yourself and learn a little bit. And I'm from Rochester and he's from Chicago. And he offers to make us something to eat to go and all the rest of that stuff. And this happens, you know? Well, we just continue on because there's nothing else to do. He's medevac, we go fix the torsion bar, we go back to the airstrip, things go on. So I don't think anything of it. I can't say I don't think anything of it, but, but I can't do anything about it, you know, and, and the years go by and all of a sudden one day I run into Dick Lawrence. He joins the USMC Vietnam Tank Association and, and he calls me up and we're talking and he goes, you know, he said, that poor kid, he said, um, I think about him all the time. I said, you know, I do too, Dick, I really do. And I said, do you know what his name was? And he said, no, I, I really don't remember. And we decided we were going to figure out who he, we didn't know who he was. He was not a tank crewman. He was a cook. So, so anyhow, so I'll kind of give you the Reader's Digest version. We finally figure out who he is. And then Dick, you know, contacts his, his, his brother and starts talking to him. And I uh, contacted headquarters Marine Corps and I told him this whole story. And they said, well, you know, you got to go through all this and fill out these it's like, okay, do the whole award recommendation. And they said, now, the only way it's going to be approved is if the commanding officer will sign it. And I thought to myself, commanding officer, I mean, I'm like going on 70. How old could this guy be? <laughs> could he still be around, <laughs> right? So, so I, what I did was I, I, I asked headquarters Marine Corps, I said, can you give me information? I gave him the major's name. And they said, no, we used to, but we can't do that anymore because of privacy issues right. and everything. So I thought, damn it. So I called a friend of mine who is in the Marine Corps Tanker Association. And I said, is there any chance you know this major? And they said, oh, hell yeah, we know him. He lives down in Texas. Why, you want his contact information? I said, yes. <laughs> I called him up on the phone. I told him, sir, I said, I hope you're up for a story because I, I, you know, I got a story for you. So mm -hmm. I went through this whole thing. I told him the whole thing about what happened that day. Because PSC Fryson was uh, a support guy from HS Company, First Tank Battalion. Mm -hmm. So when, when I told the major what happened, and, and that, but the, when we started to do research on PSC Fryson, come to find out the code for his death was self inflicted. Okay. And, and no Purple Heart awarded. I said, that's absolutely not true. So I put together the recommendation. Uh, I added my statement, Dick added. Ed, his statement, the major signed the package, and yes, the, the Purple Heart was awarded to the family. So, you know, we were, we were thrilled, you know, that we could, you know, set that part of history right, <clears throat> you know, and maybe help the family, you know, right. feel better. Because I, I couldn't imagine what his parents and his, his siblings thought mm -hmm. when, when they thought, when they heard that it was self-inflicted. I mean, I just right. I couldn't imagine because it was, it, was, it was not true, just not true.
So, so anyhow, that's, that, that's where I did. So. And that, that, that speaks directly to your character and, and the fact that uh, you're always taking care of Marines. Uh, for 20 years, you did it wearing uniform and, and you still do it up until today uh, for, for this family, as well as all of the junior Marines that uh, uh, outside of COVID, obviously, um, you have an opportunity to get on and speak to those junior Marines about uh, uh, your prior service. So you're, you're, you're continuing to give back to the Marine Corps. Um, and, and thank you for that. I really do appreciate that. I appreciate the time you made here uh, with me. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the Vietnam Tankers Association is, is something that I, I've come to know and, and, and respect tremendously uh, after spending my time at Benning and having to, to meet a lot of a lot of the association members. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's really because of you gentlemen that my generation of tanker, uh, our generation of tanker, uh, were able to do the things we did. Um, and and I, I just I can't thank you enough. I really can't. Um, to, I'm going to take a moment here to, to thank the viewers. Um, thank you all for, for watching this video, uh, as well as watching all the other videos. Um, if, you're not, if you have not already done so, please do subscribe. Uh, it's through subscriptions that uh, the station continues to gain its momentum and more people get to see these wonderful stories. Uh, hit the notification bell for new notification of uh, episodes. And uh, sir, with that, uh, I'll hand it back over to you for, uh, for, for closing comments. Some for five.